forgiven us. It is not for no reason that the Lord adds this bit from his heart, the heart. Whereas we cannot control other people, we can have control of our, our own hidden realms. In fact, it's about the only thing that we can control directly. And so it depends on us whether we want to be free or not with regard to this bondage to insisting on having our rights, that is, unforgiveness. I'll get my own back. Imagine now your day, you've been damaged by someone and you're spending the whole day ruminating, repeating that person's words and repeating within yourself your own reaction to it, getting all the time worse and more entrenched, bad interior words. Or spending that day looking at love, Jesus, recommending the person who's damaged you to him and actually obeying what he has said, pray for those who damage you. One day will be sour and bitter. The other will be because it's based on Jesus, under his influence and healed by him. Which do we want? I remember in student days, I used to drift occasionally to big meetings in the university campus and they had quite powerful things going on there. They'd call people with gifts. And I remember one speaker who had real gifts giving us this testimony. He was praying in some place and he came across this lady and it was given to him to understand and he said this, it was given with such clarity that he's never had it before. This person has unforgiveness in her soul. And he stopped his prayer and asked if that were the case. And it was. She had lost her husband in the war and would never forgive the Germans. He tried to get her to realize you're holding on to something which is not doing any good. Let go. Forgive the Germans. Never. So he had to back down with his prayer. He saw that here there was a blockage, and that blockage was serious. It was damaging not only her mind, but her body. There was a hardness and a bitterness there, the cancer of the soul, unforgiveness. She was blocked. And remember, we can't completely separate body and soul. We are psychosomatic beings as long as we have the body. There is by osmosis, a chewing and throwing, and the body can become hard too, and the face. You watch the person who hates. He resembles a neck. A couple of years later, he came back to that same group, and she was there, by now, in a wheelchair. He knew that that unforgiveness had made her so hard and bitter that it was creeping through her whole body. Which do we want? Years ago, in the Shakhtar, I was given to read the two volumes of the life of St. Francis de Sales by the expert Trochu, who was also the expert of the Curie d'Ars. And it was full of stories, because it was the whole life. He was somebody, actually, who had conquered this. Not so much unforgiveness, but being able to flare up. Occasionally something came out and leaked accidentally. Just one time when he was preaching against the Calvinists and really tore into them. But on the whole, he got a name for being gentle. The gentle Christ of Geneva. He mastered himself. And there was a goodness there which was the fruit of being in love with Jesus. In his clergy, there was a priest who was a thorn in his flesh. He was a nuisance, however, he was gifted. 
He bore with this for a long time. Eventually, a vacancy came up in a bishopric nearby, and he used his influence, yes, to get this man elected bishop. And when the man heard it, he broke into tears. And the commentary of the author was, il a compris ce que c'était que la vengeance des saints. He understood what was the vengeance of the saints. You may have seen the film, The Scarlet and the Black, on Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty, who hid and saved so many Jews under Pius XII. There is a scene towards the end where Kepler, his arch enemy, the head of the staff of the Germans there, who was out to get him, came to him in secret and asked if he, when he saw what was going to happen, would give safe conduct through Vatican channels to his wife and children. Monsignor said nothing clearly in reply and went off. Years later, when he was in prison in Kepler, he kept coming to see him regularly. This warmed the heart of this dangerous man. Eventually he had the courage to ask, or rather, actually, Monsignor Hugh asked him, who was it that got your wife and children into safety? And his answer was, I don't know. And he repeated it, I do not know. Of course it was Monsignor. Eventually, moved by the influence of charity and grace combined, he became a Catholic and died in a state of grace. You know the story of the officer, he may have been head actually of Auschwitz, who was butchering people in atrocious ways. He got a horde of Jesuits, but the one at the head of them was missing. So he delivered him up himself, up to the authority, and explained he was their superior and didn't want to be separated from them. The officer unexpectedly said, go and do something useful. He went off, leaving his brethren to eventual martyrdom. At the end of the war, the man, of course, was at Nuremberg, tried for war crimes, sentenced to be executed. He realised that he had to face his maker. When one is facing death, atheism suddenly evaporates. And he was a baptised Catholic and asked that it actually could get him a priest. But there was no priest really wanting to handle this man. They had an awful job. Eventually, they penetrated to the Shrine of Divine Mercy nearby in Poland and found a priest responsible for it. It was that very Jesuit who had been allowed to go and do something useful. He came and he heard his confession, which lasted between an hour and a quarter and an hour and a half. And in peace, this war criminal went with the blood of these victims, washed in the blood of the Lamb, to the Lamb of God. The first reading is about warfare. And we're all in this warfare. And if we don't take the warfare seriously, we're in danger of being trapped and caught by the wiles of the enemy, who loves to rock us to sleep. His tactics now are favoured by what's out there, and I would advise each of you here to be very careful about one in particular. Be aware of the fact that internet is loaded and weighed against you. 
It's a neutral instrument in itself, but it's being used by Satan. There are demons coming out of screens, coming into your head. First of all, it's taking time, which could be better spent, but also it's bringing you into imaginations and scenes which perhaps initially you're not responsible for, but they're there. So it's easier not to go there, not to engage, than to stop once you've started. Beginnings check and consequences follow. And there are evil geniuses out there too. Remember the prior in France saying this regarding some bandits who are very clever. On peut gagner beaucoup de mérite pour l'enfer. We can gain a lot of merit for hell. Listen to this. It's a bit old fashioned, but nevertheless, there's nothing new under the sun. Just it's now it's become more sophisticated. In 1540, Blessed Peter Le Verre, one of the first companions of St. Ignatius of Loyola, was returning from Parma to Rome, while actually going through our area, following the way from Florence to Siena. Night fell and caught him. Of course, in those days, he had to stop. Couldn't see where he was going. In the midst of a country infested by robbers and brigands, and they're about there also on the internet. He prayed to his guardian angel. Then he found a house which looked a bit okay and asked for hospitality. It was the month of October. So the weather was cold and rainy. They recognized that he was a priest. They welcomed him with respect and kindness and took him in. Come near the fire, dry your wet clothes. Thinking of the things of God and openly talking about these things to these men of faith in the house. But suddenly they heard hurried steps and by the rappings at the door, men armed to the teeth dashed into the house. Sixteen of them. They demanded noisily that all the provisions in the store be given to them. And they set to drinking and eating amidst rude songs and immodest conversations which horrified the saint. However, he maintained his calm deliberately. It was pensive and wouldn't say a word. His eyes were fixed on one thing the fire. The fire. The leader asked him what he was doing there. Sinners is very sad. This fire brings to my mind that of hell, which they shall not be able to escape if they do not hasten to return sincerely to God. However, the way he pronounced these words were so anointed and penetrating that they couldn't answer back. He took advantage of their being somewhat bemused to start talking. And he do, did what any good Christian is able to do, even yourselves, 
when put in a situation that is an open soul before you. But you can't until that is the situation. So don't be like born again Christians who insist and over insist. Wait until the Spirit is taking the first move and inviting you to come to a wounded soul who actually is able to listen. Because this is the problem out there. Very few want to listen. I conclude. When I was ordained, I had to come back immediately to Ireland to celebrate with my benefactors out here to be transferred urgently to Italy for the spouses. So the prior went up to the Archbishop immediately afterwards in Siena, and he had the faculties, because he's going back to Ireland. And orally he gave them, which was enough to open the door of confession, because not every priest has them immediately. And I realized this is power. That very evening, I heard my first confession was Fair Dominique who asked my next door neighbor before the Madonna at the end of Compton. And then began, day after day, soul after soul, and oftentimes in a bad place, you might even get people coming to you, decided to commit suicide. What do you do with that? All bits of ragged humanity. Souls for which the Lamb of God died, each one. Some would come and might go away in a huff, even bang the confession box, because you won't give an absolution. But you can't give absolution to an ongoing sin, e.g. living in a state of irregularity until it stopped. On I could go. I will tell you this. When one is handling the sacramental life, one is touching the power of God, and indeed the power of God is passing through you. Remember, immediately after ordination, very quickly being invited by friends who paid to go to Medjugorje. And there I remember confession after confession, and good ones in different languages. And there was one Italian who came up about 30, had a good confession, and I was making the absolution, you know, my God, with it helped me. Out for account. As I say, the frontier between body and soul is very thin. God is for real, and so is.